Story four of Christmas Eve and Christmas Day Ten Christmas Stories by Edward Everett Hale. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story four Daily Bread Parts four and five. Four How They Broke the Blockade. Three o'clock in the afternoon saw Huldah's fire burning in the stove, her water boiling in the kettle, her slices of ham broiling on the gridiron and quarter past three saw the men come across from the barn where they had been shaking down hay for the cows and horses and yoking the oxen for the terrible onset of the day it was bright starlight above thank heaven for that this strip of three hundred thousand square miles of snow cloud which had been drifting steadily cast over a continent was it seemed only twenty hours wide say two hundred miles more or less and about midnight its last flex had fallen, and all the heaven was washed black and clear. The men were well rested by those five hours of hard sleep. They were fitly dressed for their great encounter, and started cheerily upon it, as men who meant to do their duty, and to both of whom, indeed, the thought had come that life and death might be trembling in their hands. They did not take out the pungs to-day, nor, of course, the horses. Such milk as they had collected on St. Victoria's Day they had stored already at the station and at Stacy's. And the best they could do to-day would be to break open the road from the four corners to the station that they might place as many cans as possible there before the down-train came. From the house, then, they had only to drive down their oxen, that they might work with the other teams from the four corners, and it was only by begging him that Huldah persuaded Reuben to take one lunch-can for them both. Then, as Reuben left the door, leaving John to kiss her good-bye, and to tell her not to be alarmed if they did not come home at night, she gave to John the full milk-can into which she had poured every drop of Carrie's milk, and said, it will be one more, and God knows what child may be crying for it now. So they parted for eight and twenty hours, and in place of Huldah's first state party of both families, she and Alice reigned solitary that day, and held their little court with never a suitor. And when her lunchtime came, Huldah looked half mournfully, half merrily, on her array of dainties prepared for the feast, and she would not touch one of them. She toasted some bread before the fire, made a cup of tea, boiled an egg, and would not so much as set the table. As has been before stated, this is the way with women. And of the men, who shall tell the story of the pluck and endurance, of the unfailing good will, of the resources in strange emergency, of the mutual help and common courage, with which all the men worked that day, on that well-nigh hopeless task of breaking open the highway from the corners to the station. Well-nigh hopeless, indeed, for although at first, with fresh cattle and united effort, they made in the hours, which passed so quickly up to ten o'clock, near two miles headway, and had brought yesterday's milk thus far, more than halfway to their point of delivery, at ten o'clock it was quite evident that this sharp northwest wind, which told so heavily on the oxen and even on the men, was filling in the very roadway they had opened, and so was cutting them off from their base, and by its new drifts was leaving the roadway for to-day's milk even worse than it was when they began. In one of those extemporized councils, then, such as fought the Battle of Bunker Hill and threw the tea into Boston Harbor, it was determined at ten o'clock to divide the working parties the larger body would work back to the four corners and by proper relays keep the trunk line of road open if they could while six yoke with their owners still pressing forward to the station should make a new base at lovejoy's where when these oxen gave out they could be put up at his barn it was quite clear indeed to the experts that that time was not far distant. And so indeed it proved. By three in the afternoon, John and Reuben and the other leaders of the advance party, namely the whole of it, for such is the custom of New England, 
gathered around the fire at Lovejoy's, conscious that after twelve hours of such battle as Pavia never knew, nor Roncesvalles, they were defeated at every point but one. Before them, the mile of road which they had made in the steady work of hours was drifted in again as smooth as the surrounding pastures, only, if possible, a little more treacherous for the labor which they had thrown away upon it. The oxen, which had worked kindly and patiently, well handled by good-tempered men, yet all confused and half-dead with exposure, could do no more. Well, indeed, if those that had been stalled fast and had had to stand in that biting wind after gigantic effort escaped with their lives from such exposure. All that the men had gained was that they had advanced their first depot of milk, two hundred and thirty-nine cans, as far as Lovejoy's. What supply might have worked down to the four corners behind them they did not know, and hardly cared, their communications that way being well-nigh cut off again. What they thought of and planned for was simply how these cans at Lovejoy's could be put on any downward train, for by this time they knew that all trains would have lost their grades and their names, and that this milk would go into Boston by the first engine that went there, though it rode on the velvet of a palace car. What train this might be they did not know. From the hill above Lovejoy's they could see poor old Dix, the station-master, with his wife and boys, doing his best to make an appearance of shoveling in front of his little station. But Dix's best was but little, for he had but one arm, having lost the other in a collision, and so as a sort of pension the company had placed him at this little flag-station, where was a roof over his head, a few tickets to sell, and generally very little else to do. It was clear enough that no working parties on the railroad had worked up to Dick's, or had worked down. Nor was it very likely that any would before night, unless the railroad people had better luck with their drifts than our friends had found. But as to this, who should say? Snowdrifts are mighty uncertain. The line of that road is in general northwest, and to-day's wind might have cleaned out its gorges as persistently as it had filled up our cross-cuts. From Lovejoy's barn they could see that the track was now perfectly clear for the half-mile where it crossed the Prescott Meadows. I am sorry to have been so long in describing thus the aspect of the field after the first engagement but it was on this condition of affairs that, after full conference, the enterprises of the night were determined. Whatever was to be done was to be done by men, and after thorough regale on Mrs. Lovejoy's green tea and continual return to her constant relays of thin bacon gilded by unnumbered eggs, after cutting and coming again upon unnumbered mince pies, which, I am sorry to say, did not in any point compare well with Huldah's, each man thrust many doughnuts into his outside pockets, drew on the long boots again, and his buckskin gloves and mittens, and, unencumbered now by the care of animals, started on the work of the evening. The sun was just taking his last look at them from the western hills, where Reuben and John could see Huldah's chimney smoking. The plan was, by taking a double hand-sled of Lovejoy's, and by knocking together two or three more, jumper-fashion, to work their way across the meadow to the railroad causeway, and establish a milk depot there, where the line was not half a mile from Lovejoy's. By going and coming often, following certain tracks well known to Lovejoy on the windward side of walls and fences, these eight men felt quite sure that by midnight they could place all their milk at the spot where the old farm crossing strikes the railroad. Meanwhile, Silas Lovejoy, a boy of fourteen, was to put on a pair of snowshoes, go down to the station, state the case to old Dix, and get from him a red lantern and permission to stop the first train where it swept out from the pitman cut upon the causeway. 
Old Dix had no more right to give this permission than had the humblest street sweeper in Ipcham, and this they all knew. But the fact that Silas had asked for it would show a willingness on their part to submit to authority, if authority there had been. This satisfied the New England love of law on the one hand. On the other hand, the train would be stopped, and this satisfied the New England determination to get the thing done anyway. To give additional force to Silas, John provided him with a note to Dix, and it was generally agreed that if Dix wasn't ugly, he would give the red lantern and the permission. Silas was then to work up the road and station himself as far beyond the curve as he could and stop the first down train. He was to tell the conductor where the men were waiting with the milk, was to come down to them on the train, and his duty would be done. Lest Dix should be ugly, Silas was provided with Lovejoy's only lantern, but he was directed not to show this at the station until his interview was finished. Silas started cheerfully on his snowshoes, John and Lovejoy at the same time, starting with the first hand-sled of the cans. First of all into the sled, John put Huldah's well-known can, a little shorter than the others, and with a different handle. Whatever else went to Boston, he said, that can was bound to go through. They established the basis of their pyramid, and met the three new jumpers with their makers as they went back for more. This party enlarged the base of the pyramid, and as they worked, Silas passed them cheerfully with his red lantern. Old Dix had not been ugly, had given the lantern and all the permission he had to give, and had communicated some intelligence also. The intelligence was that an accumulated force of seven engines, with a large working party, had left Groton Junction downward at three. Nothing had arrived upward at Groton Junction, and from Boston Dix learned that nothing more would leave there until early morning. No trains had arrived in Boston from any quarter for twenty-four hours. So long the blockade had lasted already. On this intelligence it was clear that with good luck the down train might reach them at any moment. Still the men resolved to leave their milk while they went back for more, relying on Silas and the large working party to put it on the cars if the train chanced to pass before any of them returned. So back they fared to Lovejoy's for their next relay, and met John and Reuben working in successfully with their second. But no one need have hurried, for as trip after trip they built their pyramid of cans higher and higher, no welcome whistle broke the stillness of the night and by ten o'clock, when all these cans were in place by the rail, the train had not yet come. John and Reuben then proposed to go up into the cut and to relieve poor Silas, who had not been heard from since he swung long ago so cheerfully like an Excelsior boy on his way up the Alps. But they had hardly started when a horn from the meadow recalled them, and retracing their way they met a messenger who had come in to say that a fresh team from the four corners had been reported at lovejoy's with a dozen or more men who had succeeded in bringing down nearly as far as lovejoy's mowing lot near a hundred more cans that it was quite possible in two or three hours more to bring this over also and although the first train was probably now close at hand it was clearly worth while to place this relief in readiness for a second. So poor Silas was left for the moment to his loneliness, and Reuben and John returned again upon their steps. They passed the house where they found Mrs. Lovejoy and Mrs. Stacy at work in the shed, finishing off two more jumpers, and claiming congratulation for their skill, and after a cup of tea again, for no man touched spirit that day nor that night, they reported at the new station by the mowing lot. And Silas Lovejoy, who had turned the corner into the pitman cut, and so shut himself out from sight of the station light, or his father's windows, or the lanterns of the party at the pyramid of cans, 
Silas Lovejoy held his watch there, hour by hour, with such courage as the sense of the advance gives boy or man. He had not neglected to take the indispensable shovel as he came. In going over the causeway he had slipped off the snowshoes and hung them on his back. Then there was heavy waiting as he turned into the pitman cut knee-deep, middle-deep, and laid his snowshoes on the snow and set the red lantern on them as he reconnoitred. Middle-deep, neck-deep, and he fell forward on his face into the yielding mass. "'This will not do. I must not fall like that often,' said Silas to himself, as he gained his balance and threw himself backward against the mass. Slowly he turned round, worked back to the lantern, worked out to the causeway, and fastened on the shoes again. With their safer help, he easily skimmed up to Pittman's bridge, which he had determined on for his station. He knew that thence his lantern could be seen for a mile, and that yet there the train might safely be stopped, so near was the open causeway which he had just traversed. He had no fear of an up-train behind him. So Silas walked back and forth and sang and spouted pieces and mused on the future of his life and spouted pieces again and sang in the loneliness. How the time passed he did not know. No sound of clock, no baying of dog, no plash of waterfall broke that utter stillness. The wind, thank God, had at last died away and Silas paced his beat in a long oval he made for himself, under and beyond the bridge, with no sound but his own voice when he chose to raise it. He expected, as they all did, that every moment the whistle of the train, as it swept into sight a mile or more away, would break the silence. So he paced and shouted and sang. "'This is a man's duty,' he said to himself, they would not let me go with the 5th Regiment, not as a drummer boy. But this is duty such as no drummer boy of them all is doing. Company, march! And he stepped forward smartly with his left foot. Really, I am placed on guard here quite as much as if I were on picket in Virginia. Who goes there? Advance, friend, and give the countersign. Not that anyone did go there, or could go there, but the boy's fancy was ready, and so he amused himself during the first hours. Then he began to wonder whether they were hours, as they seemed, or whether this was all a wretched illusion, that the time passed slowly to him because he was nothing but a boy, and did not know how to occupy his mind. So he resolutely said the multiplication table from the beginning to the end, and from the end to the beginning, first to himself, and again aloud to make it slower. Then he tried the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt have none other gods before me. Easy to say that beneath those stars. And he said them again. No, it is no illusion. I must have been here hours long. Then he began on Milton's hymn. It was the winter wild, while the heaven-born child, all meanly wrapped in the rude manger, lies. Winter wild indeed, said Silas aloud, and if he had only known it, at that moment the sun beneath his feet was crossing the meridian, midnight had passed already, and Christmas Day was born. Only with speeches fair she woos the gentle air to hide her guilty front with innocent snow. Innocent indeed, said poor Silas, still aloud. Much did he know of innocent snow. And vainly did he try to recall the other stanzas as he paced back and forth, round and round, and began to wonder where his father and the others were, and if they could have come to any misfortune. Surely they could not have forgotten that he was here. Would that train never come? If he were not afraid of its coming at once, he would have run back to the causeway to look for their lights, and perhaps they had a fire. Why had he not brought an axe for a fire? That rail fence above would have served perfectly. 
nay it is not five rods to a load of hickory we left the day before thanksgiving surely one of them might come up to me with an axe but maybe there is trouble below they might have come with an axe with an axe with an axe with an axe axe i am going to sleep cried silas aloud again this time as his head dropped heavily on the handle of the shovel he was resting on there in the lee of the stone wall i am going to sleep that will never do sentinel asleep at his post order out the relief blind his eyes kneel sir make ready fire that sir for sentinel sleep and so silas laughed grimly and began his march again then he took his shovel and began a great pit where he supposed the track might be beneath him anything to keep warm and to keep awake but why did they not send up to him why was he here why was he all alone he who had never been alone before was he alone was there companionship in the stars or in the good god who held the stars did the good god put me here if he put me here will he keep me here or did he put me here to die to die in this cold it is cold it is very cold is there any good in my dying the train will run down and they will see a dead body lying under the bridge black on the snow with a red lantern by it then they will stop shall i i will just go back to see if the lights are at the bend i will leave the lantern here on the edge of this wall and so silas turned half benumbed worked his way nearly out of the gorge and started as he heard or thought he heard a baby scream a thousand babies are starving and i am afraid to stay here to give them their life he said there is a boy fit for a soldier order out the relief drumhead court-martial prisoner hear your sentence deserter to be shot blindfold kneel sir fire good enough for deserters and so poor silas worked back again to the lantern and now he saw and felt sure that orion was bending downward and he knew that the night must be broken and with some new hope throwing down the shovel with which he had been working he began his soldier tramp once more as far as soldier tramp was possible with those trailing snowshoes tried again on no war nor battle sound broke down on cynthia's seat and the music of the spheres but at last working on beams long beams and that with long beams he caught the stanzas he was feeling for and broke out exultant with at last surrounds their sight a globe of circular light that with long beams the shame-faced knight arrayed the helmed cherubim and sworded seraphim are seen in glittering ranks globe of circular light am i dreaming or have they come come they had the globe of circular light swept full over the valley and the scream of the engine was welcomed by the freezing boy as if it had been an angel's whisper to him not unprepared did it find him the red lantern swung to and fro in a well-practised hand and he was in waiting on his firmest spot as the train slowed and the engine passed him do not stop for me he cried as he threw his weight heavily on the tender side and the workman dragged him in only run slow till you are out of the ledge we have made a milk station at the crossroad good for you said the wondering fireman who in a moment understood the exigency the heavy plough threw out the snow steadily still in ten seconds they were clear of the ledge and saw the firelight shimmering on the great pyramids of milk cans slower and slower ran the train and by the blazing fire stopped for once because its masters chose to stop and the working party on the train cheered lustily as they tumbled out of the cars as they apprehended the situation and were cheered by the working party from the village 
Two or three cans of milk stood on the embers of the fire, that they might be ready for the men on the train with something that was at least warm. An empty passenger car was opened, and the pyramids of milk cans were hurried into it, forty men now assisting. "'You will find Joe Winter at the Boston station,' said John Stevens to the gentlemanly conductor of the express, whose lightning train had thus become a milk convoy. "'Tell Winter to distribute this among all the carts, that everybody may have some. Good luck to you, and good-bye.' And the engine snorted again, and John Stevens turned back, not so much as thinking that he had made his Christmas present to a starving town. 5. CHRISTMAS MORNING The children were around Robert Walter's knee, and each of the two spelled out a verse of the second chapter of Luke on Christmas morning, and Robert and Mary kneeled with them, and they said together, Our Father, who art in heaven. Mary's voice broke a little when they came to daily bread, but with the two and her husband she continued to the end, and could say, Thine is the power, and believe it, too. Mama, whispered little Fanny, as she kissed her mother after the prayer, when I said my prayer upstairs last night, I said, Our daily milk, and so did Robert. This was more than poor Mary could bear. She kissed the child, and she hurried away. For last night at six o'clock it was clear that the milk was sour, and little Jamie had detected it first of all. Then, with every one of the old wiles, they had gone back over the old slops, but the child, with that old weird strength, had pushed them all away. Christmas morning broke, and poor Robert, as soon as light would serve, had gone to the neighbors all, their nearest intimates they had tried the night before, and from all had brought back the same reply. One friend had sent a wretched sample, but the boy detected the taint and pushed it, untasted, away. Dr. Morton had the alarm the day before. He was at the house earlier than usual with some condensed milk which his wife's store had furnished, but that would not answer. Poor Jamie pushed this by. There was some smoke or something, who should say what? It would not do. The doctor could see in an instant how his patient had fallen back in the night. That weird, anxious, entreating look, as his head lay back on the little pillow, had all come back again. Robert and Robert's friends, Gaysford and Warren, had gone down to the old colony, to the Worcester and to the Hartford stations. Perhaps their trains were doing better. The doorbell rang yet again. Mrs. Appleton's love to Mrs. Walter, and perhaps her child will try some fresh beef tea. As if poor Jamie did not hate beef tea. Still Morton resolutely forced three spoonfuls down. Half an hour more, and Mrs. Dudley's compliments, Mrs. Dudley heard that Mrs. Walter was out of milk, and took the liberty to send round some very particularly nice Scotch groats, which her brother had just brought from Edinburgh. "'Do your best with it, Fanny,' said poor Mary, but she knew that if Jamie took those Scotch groats it was only because they were a Christmas present. Half an hour more! Three more spoonfuls of beef tea after a fight. Doorbell again. Carriage at the door. Would Mrs. Walter come down and see Mrs. Fitch? It was really very particular. Mary was half-dazed and went down. She did not know why. Dear Mrs. Walter, you do not remember me, said this eager girl, crossing the room and taking her by both hands. Why, no, uh, yes, do I, said Mary, crying and laughing together. Yes, you will remember. It was at church, at the baptism. My Jenny and your Jamie were christened the same day. And now I hear, we all know how low he is, and perhaps he will share my Jenny's breakfast. Dear Mrs. Walter, do let me try. Dear Mrs. Walter, do let me try. Then Mary saw that the little woman's cloak and hat were already thrown off, 
which had not seemed strange to her before, and the two passed quietly upstairs together, and Julia Fitch bent gently over him, and cooed to him and smiled to him, but could not make the poor child smile. And they lifted him so gently on the pillow, but only to hear him scream. And she brought his head gently to her heart, and drew back the little curtain that was left, and offered to him her life. But he was frightened, and did not know her, and had forgotten what it was she gave him, and screamed again. And so they had to lay him back gently upon the pillow. And then, as Julia was saying she would stay, and how they could try again, and could do this and that, then the door-bell rang again, and Mrs. Coleman had herself come round with a little white pitcher, and herself ran upstairs with it, and herself knocked at the door. The blockade was broken, and the milk had come. Mary never knew that it was from Huldah Stevens' milk can that her boy drank in the first drop of his new life. Nor did Huldah know it, nor did John know it, nor the paladins who fought that day at his side, nor did Silas Lovejoy know it. But the good God and all good angels knew it. Why ask for more? And you and I, dear reader, if we can forget that always our daily bread comes to us because a thousand brave men and a thousand brave women are at work in the world, praying to God and trying to serve Him, we will not forget it as we meet at breakfast on this blessed Christmas day. End of Story 4, Parts 4 and 5